Great. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Matthew Barbario as this month's speaker in our cross-disciplinary seminar series on metabolic disease. Since 2018, Dr. Barbario has been an assistant professor in the Department of Exercise and Nutrition Sciences at Milken Institute of Public Health here at GW. He received his PhD from Auburn University in Kinesiology and Exercise Physiology before moving to DC, where he did a postdoc at Children's National. And while at Children's, it's really where he developed a really strong framework that has supported his current research program at GW, where he's focused on understanding how metabolic disease associated molecular and epigenetic changes in adipose tissue will result in peripheral tissue dysfunction. So a large part of, of the work that I've, I've seen of Matt's over the years has really focused on identifying peripheral markers and signaling pathways that are going to um, lead to the dysfunction of macrophages in particular. And one thing I really like about um, his, his work is that while things are, experiments are designed to explore metabolic disease at the molecular level, he really draws in and examines how lifestyle changes and, and some of these, these bigger picture um, aspects of life that we can influence can prevent or reverse some of the associated molecular and cellular dysfunction that occurs uh, with the disease. So much of, of this highly translational work has been done not only with a lot of human samples, but sometimes, you know, samples that he has to give himself, which is also uh, quite applaudable. Uh, but I, I've been really impressed with how Matt's been able to build his research program and train a really highly functional group of exceptional GW undergraduates that are here, um, really taking advantage of, of all the resources that he has. So with that, Matt, we're all really excited to hear about your research, and we look forward to a, a really engaging conversation surrounding this. Okay, well, first, thank you. I hope I live up to that generous introduction, and first, just um, let me uh, thank Brett for inviting me and Lee and for putting on this uh, very interesting sort of seminar series over the past uh, year. Um, it's been great to go back and watch some of them because um, I haven't been able to attend at all times. Um, and I just want to make sure you, we are able to see my slides at the current second, the current moment, right? Great. All right. So today we're going to talk about HDL, HDL characteristics and function in metabolic syndrome and obesity. Um, allow me to caveat that, that since metabolic syndrome and obesity are major risk factors for cardiovascular disease and the well-known role for HDL in cardiovascular disease, we'll also be focusing, he focusing heavily on cardiovascular disease, uh, but I hope to sort of put my uh, own interesting spin on it, uh, talking about metabolic syndrome and obesity as well. So I do have some goals today, um, some of which is making sure we're all working from the same plane or from the same platform when it comes to HDL and cardiovascular disease, uh, understanding the biological role, its relationship to cardiovascular disease, and what are some actual limitations to this understanding. And then talking about HDL function and characteristics. What are these actual measurements of HDL function? Um, is there a relationship between the function of HDL and cardiovascular disease? And then get into some experimental studies um, and talk about some HDL function and pediatric obesity from my previous work. And then lastly, you know, can we actually modify HDL function? I think we all know that we can modify HDL con uh, cholesterol concentrations, but can we modify the actual function and characteristics of HDL? We'll use bariatric surgery and exercise because they're great models um, and give a little bit of a synopsis about this and then talk about some of my work with acute uh, exercise and HDL function. So um, some background here, um, we all know that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of uh, all-cause mortality in the United States. Um, and an interesting sort of factoid um, that I've never seen quantified or you know, maybe I'd forgotten is that if you increase whole blood cholesterol by 1%, um, you actually increase your risk for coronary heart disease by 2%. And so I thought that was just an interesting way to quantify what even slight clinical changes in total cholesterol mean. Uh, major risk factors for coronary heart disease, obviously hypertension and smoking, physical inactivity, 
um, abnormal um, glucose homeostasis or the presence of diabetes and dyslipidemia, so changes in HDL, um, or especially when uh, individuals have low HDL, there's a strong inverse relationship to cardiovascular disease risk. Um, that being said, HDL itself um, is not an independent uh, risk factor. Um, it's often used in concert with things like uh, high LDL, high total cholesterol, and high triglycerides. Um, so it's an interesting uh, biomarker. It's a good biomarker, but it often works better when it's taken in conjunction with other biomarkers. And so one thing I grew for an appreciation was the old studies. And so let's do some historical context about where all this comes from. Um, if you go back in the literature of HDL, you'll see it's had some different lifetimes. It was really popular in the late 60s and 70s um, and kind of fell out. And then in the 1980s, uh, the Framingham Heart Study really put it back into perspective. And so what you're actually looking at here is total cholesterol and the rate of coronary heart disease in, uh, per 100 in both males and females. Um, so on the y-axis, you have coronary heart disease as a percent. Um, and then on the x-axis, the traditional x-axis, you have total cholesterol in millimoles per uh, liter. I have taken uh, the pleasure of uh, converting that into what we normally see it as in milligrams per deciliter. And then on the um, second x-axis or the z-axis, you're seeing age. And so for both males and females, uh, what you actually see here is um, as total cholesterol goes up, um, the rate of coronary heart disease does. And this is particularly important as individuals age. And so you can see, um, especially on the Z axis, that there's this increase um, in coronary heart disease in both males and females um, as total cholesterol and age go up. Now, pay attention to the Y axis because there's a biological sex difference and that the rates of coronary heart disease were higher in men uh, than in women. So total cholesterol is very significant. Um, especially in women 50 to uh, 79 years of age, men 50 to 64 years of age. When you add in uh, HDL and LDL values, the prediction becomes much stronger. Um, and then when you take HDL and use it as a ratio to total cholesterol, it becomes a very powerful predictor, um, all ages uh, in women, and it's an independent risk factor in men. Um, and again, disease wor uh, worsens uh, with age. So one more historical context about HDL is from, again, the, Farm, uh, the Framingham Heart Study. And this is, again, looking at male and female, uh, but now they've taken these individuals and they've put them into quintiles based on their HDL concentrations. So the first quintile has low HDL, which would be a, a risk factor for coronary heart disease. And the fifth quintile would be uh, the reference group, which would have uh, normal or high HDL values. And so each of these boxes are circling um, you know, all-cause mortality and coronary heart disease. And what you're seeing is um, the 12-year uh, risk date, or excuse me, the 12-year risk rate for death. Um, and in the uh, parentheses is the hazard ratio or the, um, uh, the relative risk adjusted um, and compared to the fifth quintile or our normal group. And you can see in both males and females, the risk for all-cause mortality and coronary heart disease um, is significantly elevated uh, as you go down uh, the quintiles. And so as HDL values are lower, the rate or the risk for all cause and coronary heart disease go up. Again, always a fan of looking at a historical context. I'm also just a huge fan of old figures and graphs because it's easy to make these today and I wonder how they did it back then. So what's the biology? Um, so this is one thing I always like to ask, especially um, to students because you know, my parents are not biomedical experts whatsoever, but if I asked them what good or HDL and LDL were, I'm pretty certain they could tell me good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. Um, and I think we've done a really good job, you know, from a clinical perspective of putting that into a usable context for people. Uh, but most people don't know why they're good or bad. And so let's talk about why HDL is a good cholesterol. And its primary biological role has been always assigned to reverse, reverse cholesterol transport. Um, and so let's talk about that uh, in some brief steps. First, in the liver, apolipoprotein A1 is synthesized um, and transported out of the liver. 
Um, apolipoprotein A1 uh, contains nearly no lipids and it is the primary component of HDL. Uh, once outside of the liver or um, um, even inside, it binds to an HDL molecule and makes a small HDL molecule. HDL circulates and one of its primary uh, jobs is to enter into uh, tissue beds and pick up cholesterol esters that are produced uh, mainly by macrophages. So this macrophage uh, takes up cholesterol and LDL, it metabolizes it into cholesterol esters, and then it effluxes out of the macrophage. And that's where HDL comes in, is it's what actually receives the cholesterol esters. Uh, it then goes back into circulation and it goes to back to the liver and dumps off the uh, cholesterol. Um, HDL can then recirculate or it can be metabolized by the liver and broken down. Uh, but the end result is that we get blood cholesterol homeostasis. And so uh, you can see why a long time ago we decided to say, hey, let's just raise uh, HDLC. And one way we always explain this is that uh, HDL is kind of like a dump truck or a garbage truck. Its job is to pick up um, broken down uh, cholesterols, take it to the disposal site and get it. So the idea and just so you know, I'm as a kid was preferable to Tonka trucks. Um, the idea was, hey, let's just raise it and we'll have more cl uh, cholesterol carrying capacity. And so we do try to do that and we'll talk about it in just a second. Uh, but there is something that we should understand about HDL. Uh, HDL populations are not homogenous. What this means is not all of our HDL looks like an, a single individual Tonka truck. It's really actually a heterogeneous population of particles. Um, they range in size from seven nanometers to 14 nanometers. And the, apo uh, the apolipoprotein and lipid compositions of HDL vary widely. And so let me orient you to what you're looking down here on the right. Uh, you're looking at a 2D aggregate gel. Um, they've taken a normal healthy male's plasma. They have isolated the HDL in this and they have separated it based on size on this gel. And so on the left in A, you can see uh, various dark bands that range from seven up to around the 14, 15 nanometer range. The authors were generous and animated this on uh, panel B uh, to show you. Um, essentially what you're seeing are different size HDL molecules. Again, from that seven up to like 14, 15 nanometer range. But what you're actually also seeing is different forms of HDL, uh, alpha, pre-alpha, pre-beta 2, and pre-beta 1. And then you see this 1, 2, and 3, it's actually showing you different forms of apolipoprotein. So some of them contain apolipoprotein 1, 2, or 3. And so this is just to show you that, hey, HDL, as we know it, is not this single homogeneous molecule. It's a heterogeneous population of uh, HDL molecules at different size and uh, lipid and uh, apolipoprotein composition. Our common measure that you would receive in the clinic is HDLC or HDL cholesterol. Um, but HDL cholesterol only makes up about 20% of the mass of HDL. And so it really does not actually um, give a measure at all of these different HDL particles. And this is unfortunate because HDL particles is actually a very strong and much stronger predictor of cardiovascular disease risk. And this comes from the multi-ethnic uh, study of atherosclerosis, um, the MESA study. Uh, this is just one sort of graph from the many papers from that study. And this is looking at carotid intermedia thickness on the y-axis, which is a measure, a clinical measure of the carotid, um, the common carotid artery and gives an idea of the presence of atherosclero uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And so they separated out these uh, subjects on low, high, and medium, or excuse me, low, medium, and high HDL cholesterol. And then low HDL particles, high H or medium HDL particle concentration, and high HDL particle concentration. And what you actually see is the data actually separates on HDL particles and not on HDL con uh, cholesterol concentration. And so it seems to um, be, as far as uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, that HDL particles um, is a very important uh, uh, predictor or risk factor um, 
at least for this measure uh, from this study, but it holds up um, in larger cohort studies as well as a predictor of cardiovascular disease risk. So again, well, we just raise HDLC. Um, and so we have tried. We have a, a number of pharmacologicals, niacin, statins, fibrates, um, and uh, cholesterol ester transfer protein inhibitors uh, that do this. And in certain individuals and in large cohort studies, uh, they are successful. But even when treatment does show successfully increased um, uh, HDL cholesterol concentration, um, they don't see any changes in the cardiovascular disease risk. And so um, I take this directly um, um, from Karen Barnfeld's uh, lab, and, and I thought it was a great quote, is that scientists are now therefore increasingly um, considering HDLs associated metrics other than HDLC, such as HDL particle composition, uh, particle concentration, HDL composition, and HDL function as more likely determinants of cardiovascular disease. And I think that's very interesting and very true. And so what does that actually mean? Um, what is HDL function? What is HDL characteristics? And so I thought this was a really good figure from, from the article reference below uh, that really points out that yes, um, HDL function is uh, very important for reverse cholesterol transport, but functional HDL has roles in antioxidant and uh, anti-inflammation, uh, anti-thrombosis, and anti-platelet activation. I would also point out that they separate HDL as functional and dysfunctional based on the protein composition. And so apo, apo, apolipoprotein A1 and ApoE um, are considered with functional HDLs, but then you see something like ApoC3 and ser uh, serum amyloid uh, A1 and A2 are regular associated with dysfunctional. And so functions such as reverse cholesterol transport, the antioxidant properties, antithrombosis, anti-inflammation um, are important, but there's characteristics such as the particle sizes or the composition of particles, the proteins, and yes, microRNAs that are associated. And I would point out it's probably very important to understand that characteristics and functions probably go hand in hand. And so I wanna focus on um, something that we talked about earlier, just briefly, uh, because it's important to the next uh, sort of progression of the talk, which is this idea of cholesterol efflux uh, capacity. And so HDL is one of primary um, um, function is to um, take cholesterol esters from the macrophage and take them back to the liver for um, disposal to maintain cholesterol homeostasis. Uh, but this function right here is called cholesterol efflux, and we can measure it, and we refer to it as cholesterol efflux capacity. So this is a laboratory measure, and it really measures HDL's ability to receive cholesterol um, um, from um, uh, the macrophages. We refer to it as HDL function. Um, and yes, if you're wondering, uh, it is linked to cardiovascular disease risk, and we'll talk about that here in just a few seconds. So how do we do this? Um, what is this measure? So first, you use patient plasma. So you're using a patient's sample. Um, you deplete it of apolipoprotein B, which itself is a cholesterol receiver. Um, you then take this uh, uh, depleted uh, patient plasma, which still contains the HDLC, and you incubate it with macrophages and cell culture. And these macrophages have been uh, loaded with radio-labeled cholesterol or fluorescent cholesterol. Uh, so there's different assays, but the gold standard one uses radio-labeled cholesterol. The assay then measures free radio-labeled cholesterol in the media and the cells. And what you get is a value that tells you how much cholesterol was effluxed from the cells and how much uh, remains in the cells. Um, you then compare this value to a reference group of healthy individuals. So for my laboratory in, in the um, a uh, collaborating lab that uses, uh, that helps me run this assay. Um, their uh, reference group is a thousand healthy males and females. Um, and so this measure is going back to a reference population. You're getting a value of how much has been effluxed um, from uh, the cells, uh, but you're really going to me or measure this against a reference population. And so what you're going to end up getting is a graph that kind of looks like this. 
um, which is generally between zero and 1.5. So I've seen up to two and sometimes three, but this is to sort of tip our hat to a little bit later. These come from individuals who are lean and individuals with obesity. And what this is saying is that this lean, this population of lean individuals has a cholesterol efflux capacity that's just slightly above 100% of the reference group. And that this uh, uh, population with individuals with obesity have a cholesterol efflux capacity that's maybe, I'm guessing on the axis, about 80%, 85% of the individual um, reference group. And so what you're getting is a reference uh, value for these most of the time. So is it linked to cardiovascular disease risk? And I think the um, there's a lot, and I'll show you some more, but this is a really uh, interesting sort of um, Kaplan-Meier plot from the Dallas Heart Study. And again, they have um, uh, grouped these individuals um, based on their cholesterol efflux capacity into tertile, or excuse me, quartiles. And so Q1 has low cholesterol efflux capacity and Q4 has high efflux uh, capacity. And what you see over nine years is that the individuals with low cholesterol efflux capacity and then stepwise progression uh, up towards high e efflux capacity have significantly higher risk of uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease events and total cardiovascular disease events. And so cholesterol efflux capacity seems to be very important as a predictor for cardiovascular disease and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So we won't spend the time going through all of these, but if you're interested in other studies, um, this has been shown to be in familial, uh, true in uh, familial hypercholesterolemia uh, in the PREVEND cohort and a Finnish uh, cohort, the LURC study. Um, as well, um, here is a systematic review that really encapsulates a lot of the data on cholesterol efflux capacity and uh, cardiovascular disease risk. Um, and then one of my mentors, uh, Nehal uh, Mehta up at the NIH, who works with psoriasis, which is an inflammatory um, condition. Um, and these individuals have higher risk for uh, cardiovascular disease um, that the coronary or the cholesterol efflux uh, is associated with non-calcified burden and coronary atherosclerosis. And so it seems to be a very important risk factor um, for cardiovascular disease. So what about um, cholesterol efflux capacity and metabolic syndrome? Well, systemic inflammation, I think everyone could agree, um, is a hallmark of uh, obesity and metabolic syndrome. Generally, these individuals, depending on the measure, whether it's C-reactive protein, IL-6, or TNF-alpha, you generally see higher levels of um, uh, inflammatory proteins in the system or circulating. Um, rodent and murine models, so animal uh, research has suggested that there's a link between this inflammation and reverse cholesterol transport. Generally, in high levels of inflammation, you see um, decreased um, uh, re reverse cholesterol transport functioning. So I want to focus on this study real quick because I think it's, it's really eloquent, uh, eloquent, and I think it's a, a, an example of the type of studies that we need more. And so they, these individuals used 20 males um, and females, 50%. Uh, they were aged 18 to 40. They had no medical history of cardiovascular disease, no use of tobacco or prescription and medication, and had no abnormal lipatory values. They were injected with a three nanogram per kilogram bolus of lipopolysaccharide, and then they underwent um, serial blood sampling. So these are individuals that are healthy, should have low inflammatory status, um, which they did based on measurements. Um, and then they were basically given low-grade endotoxemia um, via LPS in, uh, injection. And so what you see first off is that um, the presence of this inflammatory state, even in these healthy individuals, um, modifies the HDL composition. It decreases overall HDL concentration of cholesterol, or HDL cholesterol, and you see modifications of large, medium, and small HDL particles over this 24-hour uh, span. What does this do for coronary or cholesterol efflux capacity? You see significant differences over that 24 hours. You see about a 60% reduction in these healthy individuals just based on the presence of an inflammatory uh, condition or an inflammatory state. And so it seems to be inflammation seems to be really important. And again, we know that um, as part of um, 
uh, metabolic syndrome and obesity, uh, inflammatory condition or an inflammatory state is pretty common. So what about um, in an actual um, st uh, status of obesity? I was lucky enough uh, when I worked at Children's National Medical Center uh, to work with uh, Dr. Evan Nadler, who runs the Bariatric Surgery Weight Loss Program uh, there, as well as the Obesity Clinic. And it, he has a great cohort um, of uh, individuals who are seeking weight management care um, who are pediatrics. They generally come between the age of 10 and 14, and they enter into this program and they go through a couple years worth of lifestyle modifications and pharmacological treatment uh, for weight reduction. Uh, unfortunately, many of them do not succeed and eventually end up um, being approved for bariatric weight loss surgery. Um, we have uh, created a registry or, or Dr. Nadler created a registry study with them. And we were just so lucky in conjunction with Nehal Mata's lab to sort of send some samples to, to get an idea of this. So our cohort here, median age is 17. Again, they range from 14 to 18 by the time that they are having surgery. Um, and their BMI is 45.2 on median, uh, at the median. Uh, most of the individuals that we have have class two or class three obesity, uh, which is severe morbid obesity at this time. Uh, we don't have many people uh, in class one or overweight because they have progressed to surgery and, and individuals who are class one and, and overweight are not going to be in the surgical population yet. So just a little bit about this, um, looking at it, is that the cholesterol efflux capacity of these individuals is compromised. It's only about 18, 85%, so 15% reduction um, based on their, um, to the reference group. So inflammation does not seem to correlate in this group. Uh, we use glyc A as a measure of system, uh, systemic inflammation, and it does not correlate to cholesterol efflux capacity. Particle composition, or excuse me, uh, particle size um, of LDL and HDL molecules does seem, to, um, does seem to correlate here. But one thing I wanna point out to you, um, and we did, we're lucky enough to have some individuals uh, lean or, or to recruit some individuals to serve as sort of a control normal BMI. Um, total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and triglycerides were not significantly altered in this group. And so these are your traditional cardiometabolic risk factors for dyslipidemia. And even in these pediatric kids or these pediatric patients with class two and class three um, obesity, we're not seeing traditional modification of um, cholesterol efflux capacity, or excuse me, of traditional um, cardiometabolic risk factors for dyslipidemia. What we do see is very significant reductions in cholesterol efflux capacity of these kids. And so it, our normal uh, BMI population, just above one, uh, but what you see here, class two and class three obesity uh, individuals um, or individuals with class two and class three obesity is very significant reductions in uh, cholesterol efflux capacity before we're seeing changes in traditional um, lipid risk factors. So despite no differences in, in these traditional risk factors, we're seeing significant reductions in HDL function at you know, 14 to 18 years of age with these individuals who have metabolic syndrome and severe obesity. I will tell you, I'm not gonna bore you with non-significant graphs, but there were no differences in HDL particles or particle sizes um, in this population. Um, so that leads us to question what, what else about HDL might be changing that's leading to differences in uh, HDL function. So just to sort of summarize where we're at to, so far, is that HDL is a really good biomarker for cardiovascular disease risk but it's likely not a good target for treatment. You can raise HDL values pharmacologically, and this does not seem to really alter um, um, cardiovascular disease risk. Cholesterol efflux capacity um, is a promising biomarker. It's very interesting. It's been, a, it's been in the literature for a while, um, but it's really picked up steam over the last decade, um, especially in sort of retrospective and cohort studies. But the clinical viability of sort of cholesterol efflux capacity is a little bit problematic. Uh, first off, it requires cell culture and it requires radio labeled cholesterol um, and liquid scintillation. I don't know many clinics that or cl 
clinical um, laboratories that, that sort of run that normally. Um, I know there's a lab here at GW that, that does it um, for research purposes. I know my collaborating lab at NIH and some other places is do it, but I don't know of any like clinical diagnostic centers that do it. But this brings up the question is, is it modifiable or treatable? And exactly what would you treat? And so I want to spend the you know last part of this talk uh, talking about this. Is it modifiable and, and what are things that you could actually treat? And then what do we need to sort of continue uh, researching about this? So is it modifiable? Um, let's use bariatric surgery as an example. And the reason I say let's use bariatric surgery, it's sort of a natural study um, because these individuals get a very um, intensive um, weight, uh, severe weight loss treatment. Uh, they tend to lose weight rapidly over three, six, and 12 months. Um, and so it's sort of a natural physiological study in that matter. And so the answer seems to be a little bit uneven. Um, some studies, so 10% increases at three months, and these are correlated to changes in apo, uh, apolipotein A1, as well as adiponectin. Um, some studies show no change at one year, despite significant changes in the composition of HDL particles. And then another study, which did a really bad job of, you know, defining their, their values. And best I could tell, they show at five years, 10% increases um, in conjunction with other uh, measures of HDL function. And so the literature is a little bit, a bit uneven um, for this, but it seems that, yes, you can, through uh, lifestyle treatments, such as bariatric surgery, improve cholesterol efflux capacity and it is in conjunction with changes in uh, like ApoA1, adiponectin, HDL comp uh, particle composition. Um, there is one interesting point is that its relationship um, uh, for changes in cholesterol efflux capacity are tightly linked to changes in visceral adipose tissue. And this makes a little bit sense because loss of visceral adipose tissue um, would actually sort of um, be a major source of cholesterol. Um, and so that's a potential bio, sort of uh, biochemical uh, molecular sort of reasoning about why that might be a, a, a sort of linkage. So what about exercise and physical activity? Um, I'm not going to go through each individual study. I'm gonna point you to this incredible, uh, this very good review by Mark Sarzinski's lab down at the University of South Carolina, looking at HDL uh, functionality in response to exercise studies. And uh, again, um, there's mixed results and it seems to go study by study, but exercise seems to work. Um, exercise intensity, so how hard someone exercises and for how long seems to be very important. Um, but the real big problem is that most studies are retrospective. There's a lot of great large cohort studies in the exercise literature, uh, but most of them are not designed to address cholesterol efflux capacity. And so a lot of retrospective studies are trying to analyze this and they're not really built to analyze it. The other problem, and this is true of, of a lot of the literature in my opinion when it comes to cholesterol efflux capacity, is the cohorts, cohorts are generally older and they um, present with multiple comorbidities. And so the problem with this from an understanding perspective, not that it's a problem that we study this, but from an understanding perspective, when you take populations that are older and have been in an obesogenic environment for a long time, two and three decades sometimes, and they present with multiple comorbidities, you just have a lot of, of, of um, covariants that could be influencing the outcomes. And so um, it's a chicken or the egg thing. Was cholesterol efflux um, modified early on, or is it just a result of a, of a lifetime spent in a really uh, sort of negative cardiovascular environment? Um, and then there's really very few studies that look at sort of acute exercise. And I'm gonna tell you why I think that's really important um, in uh, just a little bit. So, um, my laboratory has started to focusing on examining the dose response relationship of exercise intensity um, and volume on HDL and HDL functionality. And the World Health Organization, I think it was 2019, released their update on uh, global physical activity recommendations. And one of their major outcomes was that 
Um, we really need to perform more studies on the dose response relationship between various amounts and intensities of aerobic, aerobic exercise and cardiovascular health. And that really hit me um, because I'm a trained exercise physiologist. Um, you know, as Brett told you, I worked at Children's National Medical Center there. I went to um, there, I went to Children's to get training in molecular work um, and how to study molecular work. And it just so happens that I got involved in cholesterol efflux and HDL function work as a side project. And when I was reading this, this really kind of hit with me uh, because it was something I identified as part of my research is that we knew a, a lot of interesting stuff about cholesterol efflux capacity. Um, exercise is an incredibly important uh, lifestyle modification. The American Heart Association recognizes physical activity as one of the seven pillars of, of lifestyle modifications to prevent cardiovascular disease or to, to, to treat cardiovascular disease. And so I made a promise to myself that the first studies, or one of the first studies I would conduct when I had my laboratory, is to study the response of cholesterol efflux capacity to acute exercise. And so that's what I did. Um, and so um, just months before the world changed, uh, late 2019 uh, into early 2020, we had started recruiting for an exercise study um, to analyze cholesterol efflux capacity. Um, and so we had to date um, recruited 11 individuals um, and they'd completed exercise trials. And just a little bit of something about this cohort is they're generally they range from uh, really low cardiorespiratory fitness to recreationally trained. Uh, they have low visceral adipose tissue area to concerning amounts of visceral adipose tissue. Um, they border, uh, the group as a whole, borderline BMI of normal to overweight uh, with individuals who are healthy BMI up to um, uh, just over the line for class one obesity. And so, uh, this, I think, is a good cohort. None of them have uh, overt cardiometabolic disease, uh, but we know that they range from sort of healthy, um, recreationally active individuals down to individuals who are likely at risk um, for developing um, uh, um, metabolic syndrome comor uh, comorbidities. And so these individuals came, um, we did all the informed consent, we did DEXA scans, we measured their VO2 peak or their cardiorespiratory fitness. Um, and uh, they, to date, had completed one exercise trial. They arrived at the lab after an overnight fast. Um, we put in um, a venous catheter, took a pre-sample. These individuals then exercised at 60% of their max capacity until they expended 300 kcals. So for those of you that don't know what that means, this is about a jog. And... Um, a, yeah, it's about a light jog for most people. Um, and these individuals burning 300 kcals did about 30 to 45 minutes of aerobic exercise. So this would meet the guidelines of the AHA, the CDC, the American College of Sports Medicine for daily physical activity recommendation. We then took blood post-exercise, uh, post two hours and post 24 hours exercise. And so um, we only had 11 subjects because we got shut down in February of 2020. And it looks like at least from a cholesterol efflux capacity that there seems to be an effect uh, at least immediately about a 10% increase. Um, whether this is sustained, it's probably, we probably don't have enough subjects to um, uh, know. We are about to start these back up. Um, but our entire group, in, including the collaborating lab um, up at the NIH that runs these measures for me, very sort of excited about sort of the profile that we see early on. The other thing that we see is that um, when you collapse all samples, regardless of when they're taken, cholesterol efflux is tightly linked um, to APOA1 concentrations, HDL cholesterol concentrations, both of which what we'd expect, but also HDL particles and uh, LDL particle concentrations. We see the appropriately in, appropriate inverse relationships uh, between these. So that was talking a little bit about HDL functionality. What about HDL characteristics? Um, the major component of HDL is the apolipoproteins. Uh, there are other major components, um, including other protein cargo and things like nucleic acids, such as microRNA. Um, evidence supports that proteins and microRNA influence HDL function. 
and also the inflammatory properties of HDL. And so what does that mean? And so let's return to sort of an inflammatory model and systemic inflammation remodels the HDL proteome. This, subject, this study took 12 healthy uh, male subjects, again, uh, healthy by all um, clinical measures. And this time they only used one nanogram per kilogram or two nanograms per kilogram. And I just wanna point out um, at the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit between the difference between the animal studies they conducted and the human studies that they conducted. So what did they find? First in cholesterol efflux, they saw uh, significant reductions during the inflammatory state. Um, and so significant reductions in cholesterol efflux capacity. And this coincides with what we saw earlier. This, uh, this agrees with what we saw earlier from the LPS injection. The one thing I wanna point out, and I think they did their graphs a little bit backwards, is looking at purified HDL and the proteins that are associated is that the inflammatory state seems to have significantly increased uh, serum, uh, serum amyloid A1 and 2 in a dose-dependent manner. And that the presence of uh, the abundance of uh, SAA1 and 2 um, is inversely proportional to cholesterol efflux capacity. So as efflux capacity goes down, Sarah, uh, SAA1 and 2 are going up. So it seems to be that the HDL proteome um, is significantly influencing uh, the HDL um, functionality. So what about microRNAs? And so I just wanna point out, and this is busy, so just bear with me one second. The HDL associated microRNAs in individuals with obesity and following bariatric surgery. And so on the left graph, what you're seeing is that um, before surgery, individuals who were considered normal, healthy BMI and individuals with obesity um, had differences in the abundances of microRNAs that are attached to or associated with their HDLs. Um, surgery resulted in the expected weight loss, but also saw approximately a 6% increase in cholesterol efflux capacity at one year in these individuals. And surgery also resulted on the right graph um, in significant um, increases in uh, the abundance of HDL-associated microRNAs, and these microRNAs do correlate to cholesterol efflux capacity. I do just want to point out that both of these graphs are in log scale. That's why it doesn't look like there's large differences. Uh, but there are significant increases in the microRNAs that are associated with HDL, and those changes in microRNAs are associated with changes in uh, cholesterol efflux capacity. So as we approach 45 minutes, um, I want to leave an appropriate amount of time for discussion um, and just cut, sort of wrap up some things that I think are important. This is not to say that HDL cholesterol is not a great biomarker because it is a very good biomarker, especially used when in conjunction with others, um, but it's not a great treatment target. Um, it's likely that you know, things like bariatric surgery and exercise that are well known to increase HDL con uh, cholesterol concentrations are likely modifying other aspects of HDL that are actually promoting the healthy aspects of it. It's not just the HDL cholesterol concentration. So HDL function and composition and the characteristics to me are very exciting frontier to explore, both from a mechanistic standpoint and as a potential uh, for identifying treatment for cholesterol efflux. Um, is cholesterol efflux a biomarker? Yes, I think it's a very strong predictor of cardiovascular disease risk. I don't, uh, I'm not a clinician and I don't necessarily understand the viability of it as a clinical viability. I know there have been efforts to move it that way, um, but my question would be, is it a really good biomarker um, for early potential changes in um, cardiovascular disease risk? We saw that with um, the, our pediatric obesity cohort, that those individuals weren't having changes in traditional uh, lipid profiles, but there was significant reductions in the functionality of their HDL molecules. I think the other thing is, and the reason I uh, presented two studies using that LPS model uh, or that endotoxemia inflammation model is I'm a really big proponent of sort of dose response experimental studies. It's how I design my exercise studies. And I think there's a really important need to understand the normal biology and physiology of cholesterol efflux and HDL function um, and HDL characteristics. 
Um, to me, the literature is overrepresented um, um, with populations that are retrospective um, and populations that are um, already have metabolic syndrome or diabetes or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. I think we really need to focus on experimental uh, studies in this, understand what the normal biology and physiology is in healthy populations. That's not to say that prospective studies aren't important or are good. I just think we're overrepresented on that spectrum and we really need to do some um, um, uh, true experimental physiology on this. So how will I spend my time doing this? Um, you know, COVID and the pandemic shut my lab down uh, for six to eight months. Um, and we weren't allowed to do human subjects research until just last August. Um, and so that original study is on ice, but you know we're sort of happy to bring it out um, in the near future. Um, and we're gonna go sort of much more detailed in the temporal sampling using different exercise protocols. We're gonna look at uh, different uh, intensities of exercise. We're gonna look at different durations of exercise. Uh, we're going to look at the uh, HDL composition using uh, NMR. We're going to look at the HDL proteome, and we're going to look at the HDL microRNA. Um, and this it sort of, to me, describes my overall approach is, is looking at acute exercise as a modifier of cholesterol efflux capacity and potentially atheroprotection. Uh, but is that through modification of the HDL proteome and microRNA? Um, do those modify cholesterol efflux capacity? Do they potentially have their own atheroprotection qualities? Is this through modification of lipoprotein profiles? And so this is what we're going to be working on. And I would really invite anyone who might be interested to um, um, reach out to me. I'd love to have some advice or, or potential collaborators on this. And lastly, I just want to thank a lot of people um, at uh, Children's Hospital, uh, the Meta Laboratory up at the NIH, um, uh, up at Winthrop, uh, Winthrop, Dr. Allison Reese helped with my postdoctoral work um, and um, the funding that has been provided. And then as Brett stated, when I started my lab here, we didn't have a PhD program. I relied heavily on, on undergrads and they were phenomenal. A lot of them have moved on to med school and PA school, um, but they've been phenomenal and have really brought a lot of energy to my research efforts. Um, and so I just wanna thank them and, and the GW undergrad population in general. Uh, because they're great to have around for research. Um, and with that said, I just want to say thanks again to Brett and Lee for inviting me. I hope you found the talk in, uh, interesting today and, and looking forward to discussion. Thanks a lot, Matt. I really appreciate that, that talk. It was very interesting and informative. I'll ask anyone with questions to either raise your hand in the reaction so I can call on people or type in the chat if anyone has problems with that and they need to just unmute, that's also an option, but I would prefer if people are able to at least do the hand raise in the reactions or, or type in the chat. While I give people a chance to get settled with some of that, um, I'll, I'll ask a question then, Matt. So I, I totally understand why chronic inflammation and in a lot of these chronic states can become um, really harmful and lead to tissue dysfunction and all kinds of other collateral damage. Um, thinking about acute inflammation and why that can be beneficial or how some of these small bouts of inflammation are, are helpful. Um, I'm curious as to whether or not there is a benefit during acute inflammation to decreasing the cholesterol efflux. Yeah, so that's like a so in exercise, we talk about the paradox of exercise a lot of times, which is that an acute bout of exercise is actually is pro-inflammatory for some time. Um, it's pro-oxidant. Um, but what we generally see is an adaptation so that the you know, next bouts of exercise are not nearly as inflammatory and not nearly as pro-oxidant. Um, and generally after exercise, you see anti-inflammatory sort of cascades. This is, I don't have a perfect answer for this. Um, I don't know that anyone does. Um, but, you know, in speaking sort of with our collaborators, you know, up in, uh, with Nahal, up the NIH, like that's actually the aspect that makes him most excited about this. And that made me excited because he's someone who spent his career already doing this. But the fact that he was very interested in the fact that 
exercise has this acute pro-inflammatory status and that it sort of momentarily potentially hinders cholesterol efflux or promotes sort of adaptation um, is sort of this interesting paradox that we face how and why that is, like what is setting, what about exercise and that pro-inflammatory, pro-oxidant sort of um, acute response is setting off changes in HDL composition or changes in HDL function? I don't have an answer for you right now, um, especially because generating new HDL and proteins might take hours to, to you know, I, I don't know the actual lifespan there. I need to probably educate myself a little bit on that. But you've hit like the the crux, you've hit the paradox like right on is like, what is it about a healthy bout of exercise creating a pro-inflammatory environment acutely that's modifying HDL, even if it's temporarily negative, potentially, what is it about long-term that's, that's sort of making it better? And if you've got some ideas, I'd love to hear them because I think it's just, it's just the paradox. And we talk about that paradox in exercise for a lot of things. Um, because it is very pro-inflammatory, pro-oxidant initially, and then sort of goes into the anti-inflammatory state. And, and there's some something there that really promotes the, the change. Great. Thanks. Bill? Oh, you're muted, Bill. More than four decades ago, I worked with a fellow named Bill Costelli, who coined the word good, good cholesterol. And it's exciting to see the progress uh, you're making and others in this area. In one of the early slides, you showed that there was an antioxidant component to the HDL uh, complex. And I wondered if um, you could talk about that. I know LDL carries tocopherol and probably all the lipid carrying lipoproteins do carry antioxidant molecules. Is there another mechanism of antioxidant component to the HDL? So that's, um, that's, a, that's an interesting, let me go back to what, why I think it's problematic to start with to like kind of understand that is there's not like a really good model to assess sort of anti-inflammation or anti-oxidant. Um, so there's not like a standard test you would run um, exposing something to HDL that might be pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. Um, and measuring it. So there's not like this real good gold standard measure of it. You know, most times I see like exposing a cell type to HDL and then measuring the amount of TNF alpha that's produced by that cell. So there's not like this really great component uh, or great measure to do. What I do see a lot is that a lot of people focus on the anti-inflammatory properties of the individual proteins. Um, and so what are those individual proteins promoting? So I showed you that with a, a SA, a serum, serum, serum amyloid A1 and 2. So I personally don't necessarily understand the, the inflammatory mechanism of those individual proteins. Um, so I would need to go back and get a little bit more familiar with those individuals. Um, but most people tend to link it to the proteins. The microRNAs are a little interesting on the other side of it because HDL it's seen more of a carrier of microRNAs so that they take them to a cell and the, and the cells use those microRNAs. So it's been shown that HDL associated microRNAs are taken up by the liver and other cells and they affect ABCA1 and ABCG1 um, expression in those cells. And so again, the, the literature has assigned anti and pro-inflammatory um, nomenclature to those microRNAs I don't think it's the best nomenclature for them, but I think what they're getting at is like sort of the downstream response of those individual microRNAs. I don't think those microRNAs themselves are causing inflammation. Um, and um, so I think that's sort of where we're at with it, at least as far as I see, um, is really sort of understanding better, um, one, the downstream, the downstream effects of those individual proteins, uh, but on the microRNA side, understanding where they're going, why, there's, why they're associated with HDL, what they're causing in the cells, and coming up with a better nomenclature than anti and pro-inflammatory microRNAs, because I don't really like that nomenclature. Thank you. Okay, so there's, there's also um, 
some comments and questions here in the chat. So uh, the first question in the chat is, can you say a little more about visceral adipose tissue, how it's measured, and the potential ramifications of the variable ways it's measured in literature? So the gold standard would be uh, MRI. Um, and again, it's an image, a uh, cross-sectional image, and it's an algorithm that, that uh, measures it. Um, DEXA has, uses X-ray. And again, it's an algorithm that sort of determines based on density and, and, the, and the crossing of the, uh, the X-ray beams through it. Um, DEXA is acceptable and it's sort of in agreement with MRI. MRI is the gold standard. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess, other than taking out all the visceral adipose tissue and weighing it, there, there's there's no other way to, to like do it as, as accurate as possible. As far as ramifications, um, you should always try to do the best measure you, you have available. And I, I know this from various grant reviews is that they want MRIs to, to determine uh, visceral adipose tissue depots, um, but, I'm not sure that there's like major ramifications of using DEXA if that's what's what's available to you. Um, you know, it's it's more viable for most researchers, and from the literature I can see, it is pretty in agreement with what you get with with MRI. Um, and so, as far as like variables or the ramifications. I think the ramifications come when people try to use a little bit more, uh, what's the word for them? Trying to make inference about like waist circumference to like visceral adipose tissue. Waist circumference is a great sort of utility to assess sort of phenotype, but I've seen instances where they try to relate that to tissue distribution and I've never seen anything that like links that. So, yeah, I, I think I don't I don't have many major thoughts about the ramifications other than I think MRI MRI is seen as a gold standard. I think DEX is a pretty acceptable way of of, of determining visceral adipose de depot volume. Brett, you you've done a lot of I know I'm not I, I know you're more in animals, but you have any thoughts? You're a little bit more heavy on the the adipose tissue side than I am. Yeah, I mean a, a lot of people just rely like you're saying on on MRI to, to get an understanding of things. And, and maybe if you can try to balance that with biopsies so you can get an understanding within the, the adipose tissue, if there's major differences in the size um, of, of the adipocytes, because the same mass could be full with uh, more cells or, or, or fewer cells. Um, yeah. It, another thing came into the chat where PET scan, but that you're giving you know, some, some harmful things to the patient as well to, to get a little bit more of an accurate assessment. Yeah, and so we, we have done um, visceral depot biopsies with our, our surgical patients because we already have access to it. And I do know that like, in agreement with the literature in, in pediatric obesity, um, you see differences from subject to subject. Even if they have similar visceral adipose depots, like the average size of, a, of an individual fat cell is different in those individuals. And we see molecular and epigenetic differences as well. Um, and so I would, I would need to go and see Roman, Roman Barres um, over in Karolinska might be a good starting point. He always had some really interesting stuff in that area. But yeah, I, I think that, um, there's no, there's no great way. Um, and it requires a surgical population. It, it was agreed upon by the, the, the person asking the question that patients will not like having all of their visceral adipose tissue removed <laughs> to get a good assessment. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I know we're, we're at the, the hour. Um, I want to not only um, acknowledge and 
and um, really applaud Eve Fain for being such an interactive um, reactionist, but also uh, putting a lot in, in the chat here that I think Matt would be worth taking, taking a look at. Um, she, she went through, mentioned a few things, including a, a pet theory um, that at night the liver is uploading energy into the muscles and, and it's circadian rhythm based, uh, referencing Dr. Karen Esser as someone who's researching this and also mentioned part of the inflammatory process and, and, and how there's a, a, some literature out there on the, the messengers, the communication that's occurring, being required or, or, or contributing to the, the beneficial responses like what you were mentioning before in the, the paradox. So um, yeah. don't know within the literature how um, good some of those models are, but at least there seems to be some sort of a, a nice correlation there with messengers, yeah. you know, the messenger systems being active there. Yeah. I mean, Karen Esser is great with, um, with her circadian work and um, um, there's, there's a whole group of individuals in that circadian biology group that have really sort of unlocked sort of the circadian uh, sort of circadian rhythm of metabolism. Um, and again, going back to my pet story that I think is important is like, again, with human subjects, you can really modify the circadian clock and, and uh, whether it's with feeding signals or whether it's sleep uh, what, and, and exercise. And so there's like a lot of great opportunity, opportunity there to modify the circadian clock. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Matt. You are our final GW person for our cross-disciplinary seminar series from, from here on out. We have uh, three more external speakers. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone to not only check the, the website for, and the information is in the chat for this, for videos on the past presentations, but also to register for the upcoming events. Thanks for having me, Brett. I really, really enjoyed doing this. Great. You're, you're welcome. And we really, we really appreciate your, your time in the presentation. All right. Take care, everyone. Hopefully we see you next week or next month.